We're about two minutes too, so if you want to take a little break, uh, that'd be fantastic, or some water. Lexi, what do you need? You know, this morning in the homily when you talked about it. Oh man, I gotta grab my... Are you ready? Nice to be together. All right, let's start with our little prayer. So if you have a little folder there, open up your folder for your prayer before study with St. Thomas Aquinas. It should be a yellow uh, cardstock. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, creator of all things, true source of life and light and wisdom, lofty origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your brilliance Penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness into which I have been born and obscurity of both sin and ignorance. 
Give me a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations, an ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Therese and uh, St. Louis and Tilly Martin, pray for us, and St. Joseph, pray for us. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, uh, have you been able to express yourself with thoroughness and charm to each other at your tables? Or is it closer to judgmentalism and biting and uh, of that nature? I hope not. We'll see what happens there. The middle ground, somewhere in the middle for the sometimes thorough, sometimes charmful, sometimes none of the above. Okay, so if you have your little um, bookmark there, which is, uh, I've told you how many, how many times already, how much I like this bookmark. We are still in this white section here. So in the, uh, it's the second uh, row there. So we went through the mustard seed. We looked a little bit of the persecution of the church in the first couple hundred years, uh, first 300 years of the church. And then now we're looking at uh, this conversion and councils with the uh, conversion of Constantine. We looked at last time and He's um, kind of a mixed bag. We're certainly grateful for the Lord's work through him and allowing our brothers and sisters to practice the faith. Uh, there in the early 4th century, we looked at the Edict of Milan and giving us permission to publicly uh, practice our faith. We also looked at uh, a few of the heresies uh, during this time, uh, the heresy of Donatism, uh, which is said that basically you have no chance of coming back into the church. So it was very rigorous. Uh, additionally, it said that uh, clerics who had folded in the faith and compromised the faith in the persecution essentially lost uh, their efficaciousness in the sacrament. So you couldn't trust them in terms of the mass that they celebrated or if your sins really were forgiven or the baptisms that they performed uh, or the anointing of the sick or the marriages which is a horrible heresy because it says that all of the power of the sacraments doesn't come from the priest, Father Andre. Where does the power come from? From God, right? So even if you have the worst priest imaginable, right? And you, you have one that's pretty close to all, that's imaginable here at St. Therese. You can still be absolutely 100% confident that the mass is valid, right? And that, that your sins are forgiven and that um, you know, you're know you anointed, that you receive um, consolation and peace and strength in your soul when you're sick uh, because all of that comes from Jesus. Now, obviously, you want your priest to be happy and generous and holy because that helps, right? It certainly helps because we are a sacrament as well. Our very person, our personality, God works through us. Just like marriage is a sacrament through a husband and wife, God builds his kingdom through their generosity and forgiveness and flexibility with each other. So there's a sense that there's a sacrament. So there's a couple sacraments that aren't things. They're people, right? It's through people that uh, God manifests his goodness and his kingdom grows. We also looked at Arianism, how this thing almost gobbled up the church, right? It, was, it almost tipped the entire bark of Peter over on its side. And does anybody remember what Arianism taught or what Arius taught? Jesus is not God. Jesus is not divine. There was a time he was created. He's greater than a human being, but he's less than God. He's a different nature than God. And it was so bad that Constantine said, it's time for us to call all the troops together and have a council and talk about this, the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. And we talked about how the bishops came and they looked like 
um, martyrs. They were all beaten up, missing limbs and eyes because they had all survived the persecution of Diocletian. And they condemned Arius in his teaching. And they said, we need to formulate a creed that kind of summarizes our faith, the sacred scriptures and the tradition of the church up to its time. And so we have the Nicene Creed where uh, in the middle of that creed, it says that Jesus is begotten of the Father and that he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. He's consubstantial, right, of the same substance or nature as the Father. He too is God, right, a distinct person from the Father, but he shares the same nature as the Father. In other words, the Son has always existed. The Father has always been a Father. So they hammered out uh, some key um, principles or articles of faith uh, in, the, in the Council of Nicaea, which we still profess at Mass today. We looked at monasticism and the beginnings of monasticism with Pocomius, uh, with the first communities coming together, St. Anthony Abbot, uh, whose feast day is right around the corner, right? So next week we're celebrating St. Anthony Abbot. Um, how long did St. Anthony live for? Do you remember how long he lived for? 105, 106 years. It's a kind of diet is this guy, you know, living on type of thing, you know, a sense of prayer, intimacy. I mean, in that time, that was unheard of for anybody to live that old. Even today, with all of our medical advancements and technology, it's still difficult for uh, people to live into their 90s and 100s. And then we looked at Julian the Apostate, who um, was burned as a kid because, his, uh, unfortunately, some Christians had killed his family members. So he had a real animosity towards the faith and um, tried to reverse, in some sense, his baptism and began to attack the church and to build a counter church uh, to that. Even tried to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem to discredit Jesus and his prophecy. And uh, uh, he had a very horrible ending, and he said, Oh, Galilean, right, you have won, right, you have won, oh, Galilean, from me. Usually when you fight against Jesus, it, it usually doesn't go well for you uh, very well. That's just at the end of the day, right? So this, that's our little review. We're going to finish chapter 3 here. Uh, we have pages 113 and 146, the second half of chapter 3. We're going to look at some church fathers. We're going to look a little bit at the Counts of Ephesus. We're going to look at the first great pope, right? The first title of great with Leo I, 5th century. We'll look a little bit at the collapse of the Roman Empire. And then we'll just look at, kind of touch on the conversion of Clovis, who is the king of the Franks in this um, uh, Frankish kingdom for a couple hundred years, but this dynasty uh, of uh, Merovingian uh, kings for 200 years uh, there. So we're going to learn a few things here. There'll be some things you already know and some things you'll pick up and learn. I won't ask you if you did the reading. You know, I wonder if you did the reading, huh? That'd be nice. If, if you do the reading, you get a lot more out of it versus me just yapping up here. You'll get something, but if you do the reading, you'll get a lot more out of it. Uh, the church fathers. So these are the heirs of the apostles. They're leaders, obviously. They're teachers of the early church. Uh, the church fathers, typically now, there's a little bit of disagreement here, but always from the first century to roughly the eighth century or the 700s. Uh, many times, uh, um, scholars consider St. John Damascene is the final church father. There will be some who argue that St. Bernard of Clairvaux is the last one, so they can argue that in the universities, we don't have to worry about that here. Just know that it runs about 700 years, the first 700 years of the church. About nearly 90 uh, men or individuals considered church fathers there. There are hermits, there's monks, some are popes, some are apologists, some are preachers, um, some are philosophers, lawyers, scholars, theologians, saints, kind of all walks of life uh, to be considered a church father. Uh, they wrote scripture commentaries, um, Beautiful reflections and insights into sacred scripture, lots of theological works to explain the faith or defend the church against heretical teachings, uh, and they were uh, instrumental in defending uh, uh, Jesus' little ship against false teachings called heresies. Church fathers, um, you might ask yourself, well, what does it take to be a church father? How does one get into that category? And uh, Weidenkopf uh, talks a little bit about the four qualities or basic criteria that have to be met to be considered a church father. First of all, uh, you have to be orthodox, right? You have to hold 
to what the deposit of faith is or what the church teaches. So if you have part of your writings are erroneous or against the church's teaching, you could not be considered a church father. Um, your own personal holiness uh, is absolutely critical here. And not just virtuous in one area, but really trying to be virtuous in all areas of your life. Um, the church must approve of your way of life and uh, your writings as well as it's um, discerned by the Holy Spirit. And then this word antiquity, uh, which just simply means ancient, uh, you must, to be a church father deity of the ancient times or before the Middle Ages. So those first few, a um, uh, couple hundred years of the church, well, all the way up to year 700. So once you start to move into 800, 900, uh, the year 1000, 1100, those are kind of more the Middle Ages. And so we'd be moving out of the church fathers. Weidenkopf uh, talks about a few church fathers. Obviously, you can't talk about all of them in a summarized version of the book. He, takes, he talks about St. Martin of Tours. Uh, obviously, he's from France in the military for 25 years. Uh, the famous story where he, he closed the man, he cuts his, he gives the man his cloak who's poor uh, and wraps him because the man was cold. Everybody ignored the man. And then he, he had that dream uh, the next night where Jesus is clothed in half of his cloak, and he says, thank you so much for clothing me. I'm super grateful for that, you know. So St. Martin of Tours uh, is just a lovely man. His shrine uh, became really huge, and we're going to see that actually uh, with the rise of Islam next time, when they started making inroads into Spain and into France, they wanted to make it to that shrine to destroy it, right? Because they knew this was a place of pilgrimage for Christians. And so that's what they try to do is destroy these places because they know they're places where the faith uh, is brought to life. So they try to destroy Martin of Tours' shrine. Uh, Ambrose, um, uh, Chrysostom, uh, he's of the Eastern uh, Church, and then Jerome and Augustine. There are four um, doctors of the West during this time. Uh, Ambrose is one, Augustine is one, Jerome is one, and does anybody know who the fourth one, the fourth doctor of the Western Church? Doctor is the highest uh, title you can give to somebody. Would you? It wasn't Pope Leo. No. It starts with an A. Andre. It's Andre. Yes, Father Andre. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great, and we'll talk about him next time, okay? For those of you that were able to be in the Bible study the last three years, um, one of, you probably, you, you might now, I hope you know my personality a little bit, um, you know that I like art. I just, I'm just really fascinated by art. It speaks to me. Um, I sometimes use it during my prayer time. I'll have a piece of art and I'll pray the rosary or the chaplet and just just let that piece of art soak into my soul as it, it speaks to my soul and gives me life. Um, right now I'm looking at pieces of art of little Samuel um, being raised. Um, there's some beautiful pieces out there for little Samuel being dedicated in the temple because that's the daily mass readings right now, the first readings. Great um, piece of art here of Ambrose. Look at that. Man, that I'm trying not to be envious of that beard uh, there. It's just that crozier and that beard and his mitre there. So what do we know about good old Ambrose? Um, comes from a pretty prominent Roman and family, pretty uh, well-to-do, noteworthy family. Um, had martyrs in his uh, family line and his ancestors. Um, he is a very skilled and a man of uh, tremendous gifted intellect. He embraced uh, a secular career uh, for quite some time in politics. Um, he was extremely diplomatic, right? So he is a man who could work with other people, um, a collaborator, good listener. Um, these are all just very natural, God-given virtues uh, that God gives to many people, Christian or non. Just This is a good person to work with. He's a good administrator. He, he just knows how to use resources well, and he has skills for using, um, getting people to do um, good work. Um, he's a very studied man in grammar and rhetoric, which is the art of speech and persuasive speech. 
and law. And he even learned Greek at the time, which was fairly uncommon for a sort of Roman citizen to, to pick up Greek. Uh, he's also a man, we're going to find out here, of great peace. He's a peacemaker. Um, and he's also a man who they considered to be just. Um, he'd always make just decisions and things like this. At age 29, um, his skills are recognized, and he's appointed as a governor uh, of a province there. You probably don't know where that is, Liguria and Amelia, with a regional seat there in Milan. So he's always going to be associated with Milan, with the beautiful city of Milan. Uh, he's very efficient. He's fair. He's conscientious. He has a deep love for the people, and the people recognize this, right, all these gifts that he has, and he's a good governor. Uh, so uh, divine providence would have it that the bishop of Milan, uh, who is kind of a noted Arian bishop, so he is a man not, that does not hold the deposit of faith or the teaching of the Council of Nicaea there, uh, that bishop dies in 373, and so you have kind of a crisis that arises. The clergy and the people gather to elect a new bishop, which is done very differently than, than it is now, right? It's, so it's sometimes it's the emperor who selects the bishop, sometimes it's the people, and sometimes it's the clergy. Now the process is done differently. The Orthodox, those who hold the um, Council of Nicaea, they're like, this is a great opportunity to get our guy in there, right? To get an Orthodox uh, bishop in there. And the Arians um, said, no, we want one of our guys in there. And so they get into a big fight about who's going to be the next bishop. In fact, it, almost, it turned violent uh, through shouting and verbal abuse and things like this. Ambrose is there, kind of on the side, watching this as the governor and really are urges them to peace, right, and to have unity and to have more of a civil dialogue. And the story goes that when it calmed down, a little child cried out, Ambrose for bishop. And for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit moved the people and they agreed. And they said, this man would make a great bishop. Now, for anybody who knows history, what's the, what was the problem here? He's not even a priest. He's not even baptized. He's a catechumen, which means he's preparing to enter into the Christian life, into the church. He's not even a, he's not even a baptized man. It's like he's going to think, what the heck? Uh, so he's absolutely stupefied by this. He's just a catechumen. He's preparing for baptism. He's baptized that Sunday. He's ordained a priest a few days later and then consecrated a bishop the following Sunday. That's like the fastest seminary formation in the history of the church also can be quite dangerous, right? If you have a man who's not formed, like, what are we getting here as a leader? But thanks be to God, it worked out very well. He sold all of his possessions, gave the money to the poor, and then really just started studying big time uh, the scriptures and the theological works. And he also is really attributed to de developing what's called Lexio Divina, or a prayerful reading of sacred scripture. Uh, many times during that time, you would always read out loud. And uh, Augustine notes this in his confessions that when he met Ambrose, he goes, he was reading quietly to himself and just moving his lips. And I found that to be very odd. We, we just take this for granted now, right? Everybody just reads quietly, right? And he just found this to be really odd. You always read out loud. But he was reading quietly. His lips were kind of moving. And he's praying as he's reading through sacred scriptures. Just, I find this to be fascinating, the way we as human beings do things so different in different time periods. So he has this Lexio Divino, this prayerful reading of sacred scripture. He's also known, in, known for um, his pushing against what's called the Cicero um, uh, papism, which is uh, in some sense that the emperor is above the church and that the um, emperor has the last say in things. Uh, and Ambrose would say, no, the church, you are in the church, you are not above the church. God's church has the last word because it's founded upon Christ who is God and God has the last word. And this kind of came to a head when an emperor, Theodosius, um, they got into a squabble in Thessalonica. Uh, he put to death thousands of people, you know, because one of his officials was attacked and killed. So the emperor gets mad and says, kill everybody who comes to the games the next time. And they did it. And Ambrose was just absolutely horrified by this. Like, how could you do such a thing and treat your people in such a way? And so he calls the emperor to repent. I think he even said, you can come to the church next time, but you won't find a bishop there waiting for you, right? In other words, I, I don't want anything to do with you unless you do penance. 
And believe it or not, the emperor came to the cathedral, simple clothing, and knelt down and asked for forgiveness from Ambrose before he did. I mean, it's hard to even imagine that happening today, right? Like a president coming forth or a governor or a senator or anything like that saying, I have done what's evil here. Please forgive me. I was actually in Milan. This is Ambrose, uh, his uh, skeleton here, his remains. And they have him in this uh, glass, uh, you know, kind of coffin type of thing. And uh, my friend, Father Luke, and I were there. And I remember getting there, uh, 2012. And just I remember the first time I saw those, I was like, all right, here we are. We are not in Kansas anymore, Toto. <laughs> like, this is just where the way they do things in Europe. And they don't think anything of it. Just there it is. Just right there for everybody to see. Um, can you imagine, like, walking into St. Therese and, like, that was in our altar? Like, whoa, you know? Well, seriously? <laughs> So that's the way they do things. So you can actually see Ambrose, what, 1,700 years, right? It's something to think about, some 1,700 years there, right? Oh, good old Jerome, uh, the next doctor of the church here. So interesting, interesting man. I think he's got to be one of the most fascinating uh, human beings, uh, not only in the church, but in the history of the world. I mean, to just to read about St. Jerome. Uh, born in 342. Uh, baptized uh, either 360 or 366, so he's in his 20s when he's baptized. Uh, I didn't put this on the slide, but apparently lived a very worldly life in his teenage years with that kind of personality. That's not surprising. Uh, and then apparently what brought about his conversion is he visited the catacombs, uh, the places where uh, the martyrs uh, were buried and where they celebrated mass during the times of the persecution in the 300s. And he was really moved by, I think, two things. One is, I'm going to die someday. There's something about looking at a coffin, right? That sort of awakens something in us that says, I'm frail, and I'm limited, and I'm finite, and I only have so many days. Why don't I use them wisely? And then I think he was moved by the witness of the martyrs. Like, wow, these people really loved, and they're living way better than I did. And so this brings about his conversion. He begins studying uh, theology, uh, he moves to Antioch, uh, one of the great ancient seas, lives a uh, very ascetical uh, lifestyle of penance uh, there in the desert, uh, resisted the priesthood for quite a long time, but eventually thought, you know, I could li live quietly as a priest. Intellectually, just brilliant. Uh, uh, he's a master of languages, as we're going to see. I mean, the Lord just gifted him with all these different languages to know. <laughs> I've never seen this picture before. This is Jerome cuddling up against a lion here, right? Uh, and so uh, oftentimes in the Middle Ages, they would paint uh, Jerome with uh, various symbols. One is a lion, uh, and I think it's for two reasons. One is because he has that sort of temperament, right? This temperament like a lion with these outbursts of anger and things like this. But there was a story where, uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know, uh, where a, a lion had a thorn stuck in its paw, and so it had a, if you think of a lion has a bad temper, but put a thorn in its paw, it becomes like a lion on steroids, right? And so uh, Jerome comes and he takes the thorn out of the paw, and there is a certain friendship that was had between Jerome and the lion. And so oftentimes you'll see Jerome uh, painted with a lion in his uh, paintings. Uh, also, uh, there will be an hourglass many times in his paintings to show the uh, the shortness of life and the fleetingness of life. And then he'll also be uh, oftentimes uh, painted with a book, big old book in this one, right? One of those big family Bibles, that, those ancient family Bibles there, uh, because of his intellect, and he's obviously known for translating uh, sacred scripture uh, in the Old Testament from Greek uh, to Latin and the New Testament. I'm sorry, Old Testament from Hebrew uh, to Latin and the New Testament Greek to Latin, called the Vulgate. So Damascus, uh, he goes to Rome, and Pope Damascus the I uh, recognizes that Jerome has these unbelievable gifts, uh, and he asks him to be his papal secretary. Uh, Jerome, as I mentioned, is a master at languages. Uh, he, knows, he learns Latin, he learns Greek, he learns Hebrew, and also Chaldaic, uh, an ancient language. Uh, and so he knows these languages, and that's no small thing. If you've studied any language, Greek is really tough. 
Hebrew is really hard. I mean, there's very few people, uh, Americans, that can learn Hebrew. Jeff Cavins actually knows Hebrew. He studied Hebrew and knows that. Kind of cool, because you can study scripture in its ancient language. Um, so he translates scripture into Latin, known as the Vulgate, which is still the official uh, translation of the church today, is the Latin uh, version, the Vulgate. And it's still the standard text uh, from the 6th century to the modern day. Uh, the patron saint there, he said, my patron saint is St. Jerome, there with Grumpy Cat, loves uh, St. Jerome very much. Uh, so what ends up happening is Pope Damascus dies, uh, and Jerome has an anger management problem. He has a pen uh, that can be pretty vitriolic with people he doesn't agree with. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Twitter today, right? It's that you see some of the social media stuff. I think Jerome would fit right in there at times. And he had sort of an unapologetic manner of the way he spoke and wrote. And so he created a lot of enemies in Rome. People didn't like him, couldn't stand him because of his uh, anger and the way he wrote. And so he decides to leave Rome and settles uh, in the Holy Land in Bethlehem to be close to Jesus in his birthplace. And just wants to live a very quiet life in a monastic setting in a convent that was established by two friends. He actually lives there for about 34 years. Uh, in this little place in Bethlehem. I, th I find it to be endearing, actually, to go stay in Bethlehem and live there in a little monastery. Tempted to do that at times and just pray and write and, uh, and just move things along. He dies uh, in 420, and actually he is buried uh, in a little tomb, which I've seen, that is like literally a stone's throw away from the birthplace of Christ. So I was really moved by that. We had mass where Jesus uh, was born there uh, in the crypt of the Church of the Nativity. And then you just walk right around the corner and you have the tomb of St. Jerome right there. And you're thinking, wow, what a place to be buried. Like, he's smart. Like, let me be buried right by the birth of our Lord Jesus. I don't know where that cat is buried, though. I don't know if it's uh, what it's up to. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine, we could be here all day, all right? So he is uh, one of the most influential, if not the most influential person in Western civilization, especially from antiquity. Uh, born in 354, so we're talking mid-fourth century here, born to an upper-class uh, family, born to a beautifully devout Christian mother. Uh, and who's his mom? Monica. Monica. Every mom should know and love Monica, right, and get and have a nice relationship with her, especially if you have children that are uh, a bit difficult or are wayward or strong personality or willed. Get to know Monica because she will be your favorite. Uh, he has not only influenced the church but all of Western civilization with his thought and his writings. As we all know, he lived a very immoral life in his early years. Uh, he lived with a woman. Uh, it's thought at beginning at the age of 19, having a, um, an extramarital uh, sort of relationships uh, with her for 14 years. Has a child uh, born uh, from that relationship, uh, Ideodatus, uh, which I think means praise of God, uh, reminds us that every child born, whether inside the sacrament of marriage or outside, uh, is a gift of God and needs to be cherished as such. Uh, his mother, Monica, of course, uh, prayed for him constantly and followed him around wherever he went, right? So lots of tears. She was like gum on his shoe. Wherever he went, she was there as well. So Augustine uh, falls into a heresy of Manichaeism, which is a dualistic religion, which basically says that the spiritual life um, and spiritual things are good, and the material order is bad, and there's two gods uh, uh, that created those two different realities. A good God created the spiritual world, and a bad God created a, the material world. And so he's in this particular heresy uh, for many years, and it's through the influence of Ambrose, and Ambrose's teaching, and homilies, and fatherly care, and love, and writings, that Augustine realizes, I'm in the wrong religion, in a heretical religion, and the Christian faith is the true faith. He is baptized along with his son at the Easter Vigil in 387. They still have that baptismal font 
uh, in one of the crypts of the church in Milan that you can see. It's a big old octagonal uh, baptismal font that's uh, very famous. He's ordained a priest in 391, made a bishop four years later in Hippo. Uh, he wanted to live a monastic, quiet life. Do you see kind of a theme here? Like, everybody's like, I just want to live quietly with Jesus, you know? It's just, I don't like the worldliness. Um, he administers the Diocese of Hippo. Uh, it's said that actually he took and converted um, the rectory or the bishop's residence and basically made it into a monastery. And so he could pray and read, and then he'd go out and administer uh, to his people. Uh, he had this famous saying that a convert will find many good questions in the church if he sets out to become one himself. This will be the great battle cry of the Counter Reformation. Uh, when we go, when we speed ahead uh, to the 16th century, uh, when the church is torn apart, and that uh, that the church has to come about and reform that, it'll say, "Convert thyself." In other words, if you are converted and you grow closer to Jesus and you fall more in love with Him, you will help convert the church. Right. So it's you start personally first, uh, and then. Uh, from your own conversion, you can bring about the holiness of others. I think one of the challenges we find today is nobody wants to do the hard work inside. Instead, they want to point to other people and what they need to do, or movements and leaders, and you say, how does that affect you? Right? How does that affect your life? Start here first, right? And once you start the interior work, then you can start to work. Uh, then you can, God can work through you, around you. Augustine is the bridge really between the old world, the Roman world, and the Greco-Roman world, and the new Catholic world that is forming. He is schooled in the Roman and philosophical thought, so he knows like all the ancient writings and the poets, right, Ovid and Virgil. Um, he uh, is really the unmatched thinker for the next 800 years. There's going to be nobody has an intellect as close to Augustine. So who's going to come along and perfect and systematize Augustine's thought and writings. Does anyone know who that is? Thomas Aquinas, right? So Thomas Aquinas will really come along and he'll take Augustine's writings, which are more pastoral and sort of like, they're not systematized. They're more just kind of scattered and whatever's needed at the time. Aquinas comes along and systematizes all of it. And the thing that's so beautiful about uh, Aquinas is the writings of Aristotle, which more or less have been lost. And the uh, uh, the Muslims convert them, or not convert them, uh, translate them, and so he has now at his disposal the writings of Aristotle. So he has Augustine, Aristotle, the Church Fathers, and he takes all this information and systematizes it, and writes the Theologica, right, the Summa, right, the Summa Theologica, which is the summary of theology. And so he has this huge corpus of writings that's just unbelievable. Like, you know, I, I, there's a uh, somebody once said after they canonized Aquinas, they said, "Well, no, no miracles ever happened through him. Why are we canonizing him?" And the Pope said, "Read one page of the Summa, and that's a miracle. Like, read his writings, and we don't need any more miracles, right? This is a miracle itself, you, you goof." Um, so one of his main works is his autobiography, Confessions, which really is. If you've never read Confessions, you should at some point. Um, you get a wind, it's a prayer. He's really giving you an interior window into his life of prayer in his dialogue with God. And it's like when you read it, you're thinking, I feel that way. And I've had those experiences. And you're speaking deeply to me. I mean, college students today are still reading Confessions. I mean, if it's a, if it's a college worth its salt, they should be reading Confessions, even if it's Catholic or not just for its unbelievable value, right? I once had a professor, he said, what books written today will be read in 2,000 years from now? Not many, very few. Uh, there's very few books that stand the test of time over them, and, and Confessions and City of God are, are two of those books that stand the test of time and speak to every single age. They're that good. Um, also, it becomes really the standard manual for Christian spirituality for the next thousand years. I mean, everybody starts reading confessions. Second main work would be The City of God Against the Pagans. Uh, the first part of that book, he defends the faith. Uh, so there's this claim going around that says the reason why Rome is falling apart and it's on the verge of collapse 
is because of this conversion of Constantine to Christianity or to Catholicism. And if that had not happened, we'd be vibrant and we'd be good, and, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, so uh, Augustine defends that and says, this is just a lie. It's not true at all. It's really Christianity who brings the life and really is trying to save and help the Roman Empire. Uh, the second part is, is an explanation of the two cities, right? So you have the city of man, which is founded on self-love, pride, ambition, greed, and other vices, and uh, why there's so much dissension. And then there's the city of God, founded on love of God first and foremost, a selflessness, a humility, a sacrifice, and obedience. And so all throughout time, you have these two cities in competition, the city of God and the city of man, or the city of the evil one. And at the end of the day, one is going to last and the other is not. And we're either part of one city or the other. They're distinct, yet they're commingled in time. And each individual struggles as a citizen of both, trying to be more of a citizen of the kingdom of God than of this world. He's also known for fighting many heresies. Donatism, we talked about that. Uh, it's the worthiness of Christ that makes the sacraments efficacious. And God chooses to, to work through fallen human beings, right, uh, to, to, to um, uh, administer the sacraments. So he fights against that. And then he also fights against, we haven't talked about this one as much, it's called Pelagianism, which Pelagius, uh, he was a very large man, actually, uh, of uh, England. Uh, he denied and said that the original sin from Adam and Eve was not passed on to their descendants. In other words, the human race is just good and we really don't need a savior if we just be moral people and upright people, we can save ourselves through good moral living. Uh, we don't need grace. We just need to be good through natural virtue. Pelagius believed that the human race, basically man has the capacity through our own will to live a life of perfection and attain heaven by our own graces that God's grace is not necessary. This heresy is everywhere today, right? Ask your average American about going to heaven and they'll say, I'm a good person. You gently just say, that is, a, that is a heresy, right? That has been condemned again and again by the church. This, this heresy is everywhere. I remember there was a professor in Boston College. He just said, if something were to happen to you, you know, it was the first day of class and he had them all write out. And it was, it was supposedly all Catholics, right? Why should you be admitted to heaven? And he said, like, 97% of them said, because I'm a good person. It's like only three out of his entire class even mentioned Jesus. He said, what in the heck happened to the church? It is just bought into a heresy. And this is oftentimes why many Protestants are so angry and upset at the Catholic Church because they say, you never even talk about Jesus. And you don't believe he's even necessary. Of course, it's not true, but um, they have a misunderstanding. But this, we have a lot of work to do. Pope... Um, Zosimus condemned this harshly, and, and, and Augustine wrote harshly against this. and said, this is uh, blasphemous uh, in 14, and he said that um, Rome has spoken and the case is closed. Uh, this is a, this heresy that was making its way through everywhere. He's known as the doctor of grace. Uh, he devoted the last 35 years of his life to his flock in Hippo. He died as the Arian Vandals, as a Germanic tribe, uh, were besieging his city. Think about that. He's given us the entire life of the church. He loves Rome, and he sees the entire city falling apart. If that doesn't shake your faith, I don't know what does, right? At some point, the United States of America is going to fall apart. I'm not a prophet. God never promised he'd be with us forever, right? And so where is your faith? Which kingdom are you with, right? Are you more American or are you more Christian, right? So you've got to put your faith and trust in our Lord. He died in 430 in the, in the city of Hippo. One year uh, after his death, the Council of Ephesus is called. And we'll talk about that here now. Little tapestry there uh, of Ephesus, the Council of Ephesus in 431, the year after St. Augustine passed away. So why did they gather together in the Council of Ephesus in 431? So this is another major council, right? So we have the Council of um, Nicaea, we didn't talk about the Council of Constantinople, which was in 381. It's the um, 
the uh, hammering out the Holy Spirit as the love of the Father and the Son, and that he's the divine person who has spoken through the prophets. And now we have another major council called the Council of Ephesus. They call this because the patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius, uh, he had kind of a, he's a very idiocentric man. He's a very odd, fussy man. Um, and he was very intellectual. Uh, and he moved from being that to being into, he fell right into heresy. So in his first Christmas as patriarch, Nestorius began to attack the use of the word Theod uh, Theotokos, which is the mother of God, right? God bearer. That Mary is not the mother of God. Instead, she should be Christo, uh, Christotokos, which is Christ bearer. She's the bearer of just Christ, the human nature, not the bearer of God. According to Nestorius, Mary is not a God bearer. Mary gave birth to a human Jesus, but not a divine Jesus. In short, for Nestorius, there's two different persons of Jesus, right? You have the divine person of Jesus and the human person. She, he split the baby, so to speak, right? I sometimes call this the Oreo cookie heresy. You have this kind of divine person with something in the middle, and like somehow they're connected, and then you have the other part of the Oreo cookie. And so uh, you have this kind of odd sort of, what is this Jesus type of thing, you know? So I remember one time when we were in class, he said, raise your hand if you think Jesus is a divine person. Yeah. Raise your hand if you think Jesus is a human person. Yeah. He said, like, my whole class just committed heresy. <laughs> Jesus is not a human person. He's a divine person with a human nature, a perfect, intact, complete human nature. But he's not a human person. He's the divine person. It's a very important, seems like splitting hairs, but it's very important that he's a divine person with a human nature. He's not a human person. St. Cyril of Alexandria starts hearing about this, starts reading this, and goes, what the heck is going on in Constantinople? That place is crazier than a $3 bill. So he begins to combat this and write against this and says, brother, this is not true. Like, that your writings are incorrect. This is fraternal correction, right? And he's afraid that we're going to have this another big destructive Arianism sort of monster cancer thing start to grow. Remember, the church is still recovering from Arianism, and now you got this thing going on. So he writes to Pope St. Uh, Celestine, uh, the first who condemns the writings in Historius and calls accounts of Ephesus, uh, and then he sends Cyril as his papal legate, right? So he sends, like, you're my, you're my delegate, I'm heading there. Last just a day, uh, as the shortest council in the history of the church, Nestorius is condemned, I uh, suppose, and even excommunicated, uh, and he retires to his former monastery in Antioch. So things did not go well for him. Uh, the tr you know, tradition is that they all started cheering in the streets, the people, right, when they came out and said that Mary is the mother of God. This is our faith. Uh, Mary is the um, bearer of God himself because Jesus is God himself. Then we have Pope Leo. Um, I love him to death. So he is a, a, the first uh, a pope with the title great, right? So Pope Leo the Great. Uh, he's pope for 21 years during his pontificate. He really kind of uh, exerted papal supremacy throughout the church. Um, we had a lot of lax priests and uh, immoral priests, so he removed uh, immoral priests. He fought against heresies, and he is also known for protecting Rome. So he's elected in 440. He has phenomenal administrative skills and excellent intellect, especially with um, regard to the person of Jesus. Uh, and uh, we're going to see him protecting Rome here in a second. Well, you know, the church could always use another good heresy, right? So another one comes along. Uh, this guy's got a kind of an odd, quirky name. His name is Eutychus. Uh, so good old Eutychus uh, wants to fight against Nestorianism, and he says, well, okay, Jesus' human nature was absorbed by his divine nature. So Jesus just has one nature. His human nature is completely gobbled up like a drop of water being mingled in a cup of wine or like a, pee, a little drop of water in, a, in the ocean or something, right? And that'll solve the problem. Well, Eutychus goes in the opposite direction, right? And so he commits heresy in the different direction. So he's trying to avoid that notion of Jesus being two people. And so he begins teaching um, 
It's a heresy called uh, monophyticism. It's a hard word to say. It means one nature, that Jesus just has one nature, just the divine nature. That also is a heresy. Jesus has two natures, right? He's one divine person with two human natures that are not divided or commingled. So the true teaching of the church is that Jesus is true God and true man. He has both a divine and a human nature that is complete and intact. Uh, Jesus has a, uh, with that human nature, he has an intellect, he has a will, and he has emotion. Uh, now, I won't ask you to raise your hands. Does Jesus have one will or two wills? I think he has three, Father. He has two wills, right? So he has a divine will, and he also has a human will. And this is oftentimes when he says, not my will, but your will be done, right? So there was a heresy in the 7th century which said that Jesus only has one will, but he has to have a human will as well if it's a true human nature because human beings have an intellect and a will and emotions. So Jesus has to assume all of these. And so he will always submit his human will to his divine will, which reminds us that we submit our human will to the divine will, and that's, what you, that's the definition of a saint, when you submit your will to God's will. A council is called at Chalcedon. Now, this is another major council. This is the largest council to date. 500 bishops show up to hammer out uh, language around the person of Jesus, especially how is his divine nature related to his human nature? How, what does that look like? And so they hammer out this uh, particular language around this. Leo, they use Leo's writings to help them. Leo had written something called a tomb, T-O-M-B. Uh, and T-O-M-E, is it? No, T-O-M-B. Um, he writes uh, about the natures of Christ, and it's just beautiful. And they read this at the council, uh, and it says that Jesus is truly God, truly man, and must be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. They read this long thing, and they all start cheering, and they say, this is the faith of Peter, the faith of the apostles. This is our true faith. And so they hammer out this language around the person of our Lord. Interestingly, the Eastern bishops that were there decided to kind of tack on a little extra something uh, to this. And they said, and by the way, in the appendix, uh, we just want to kind of just remind you that the Bishop of Constantinople is equal to the Bishop of Rome. Like, in other words, we're, and you're like, well, that seems okay. Well, uh, it implies that the Patriarch of Constantinople has the same authority as the Holy Father, Pope, the Bishop of Rome. If that was accepted, it would alter the hierarchical structure that Christ has established in the church. Uh, Jesus established Peter as the head and lead apostle, the servant of his servants, but he has the prime authority. Pope Leo gets all of the writings of the council, and he sees this canon and he says, no. <laughs> uh, this, uh, he says, he takes it out and says, the Patriarch of Constantinople is not equal to the Bishop of Rome, right? We're brothers, but I have the final say in the deposit of faith. And this continues to create that tension between East and West, right? This tension that's, that continues to build. We'll eventually see this break in 1054, but there's a lot of tension between east and west, the, the left and the right lungs of the church. Uh, and this will linger on for centuries. Uh, and then finally, just about Leo, he's known for uh, defending the city of Rome from Attila the Hun. That's just a heck of a name, isn't it? Can you imagine if you had a child and you named him Attila? You think, well, my gosh, this kid really is a terror. Attila, and his last name was Hun, it'd even be worse. What's his name, Attila? What's his last name? Hun. All right. Have a good day. Uh, 452, Leo leaves the city with a small entourage because this whole Attila and his gang, his uh, posse, are coming in to, to take over the, uh, the uh, city there. And Leo has to really, there's, there's really no strong king anymore, right? So the church is picking up the protection and the administration of Rome and civilization. And he heads out there to meet Attila in his army, and he essentially saves Rome, right? So Attila turns back. There's a tradition that says that Attila, when he was speaking with Leo, that he saw actually Peter and Paul behind 
Leo, these kind of visions of him. He's like, what the heck is that? Uh, so I'm not going to attack this city. Uh, so he turned back. Unfortunately, three years later, the Vandals, a different tribe, uh, kingdom came in, and uh, Leo couldn't stop this one as much. And they ended up looting the whole city and didn't completely destroy it. Uh, but they also took the famous menorah from the temple of Jerusalem that Titus had uh, uh, taken from the temple in 70 uh, AD. Uh, so they took that. We don't know where even that is anymore, right? So who knows what they did with the menorah that was in the temple. It's really sad, actually. We have the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, right? So most scholars will put this at the year 476 uh, when it kind of finally collapsed completely. Uh, what ended up happening towards the end of the 5th century is Rome became very fatigued. A uh, lot of uh, political uh, strife uh, and was controlled by an army uh, whose core membership consisted of ethnic German warriors. So the history was basically that uh, when the Roman army started, you had Roman citizens, right? And were just a volunteer for the army. There was a lot of pride uh, uh, in terms of Rome. And so uh, over time, uh, the citizens said, you know what, I really don't want to... I really don't want to be a part of the army, right? I want to stay home. I want to, you know, have a farm. I want to work in the city, whatever it is. And so they began to recruit lower commoners and slaves to be in the army. Well, for a while, that didn't work. I mean, after a while, that didn't work. So they said, okay, let's start to recruit uh, Germanic tribes, people from Germanic tribes, and we'll give them citizenship and even their leaders, because they're good warriors, and you'll fight for Rome, Right, So these Germanic sort of tribes, they recruit from them. And so you basically have foreigners fighting for you. right? And it worked for a while, but after a while, they started realizing, we're doing all the fighting for you, and we're getting no recognition. And so these leaders of these Germanic tribes started saying, you give me recognition and give me some land and some money for this, or what am I going to do? I'm going to take my army, and I'm going to attack you. Right? And that's what started happening, is they started actually attacking Rome and saying, and the cities and saying, until I get my, you, know, my you, you, you acknowledge my accomplishments and give me some honor and give me some money for what I've been doing, I'm going to start attacking you. And so you have this kind of ethnic, non-Roman army attacking its own borders and attacking its own cities. And that's exactly what began to happen. And Rome begins to fall apart. The central governing authority in Rome collapsed. Its political power devolved to local German chieftains, what I just explained to you, the former commanders of Roman auxiliary troops. So it's just, it starts to be a, an absolute disaster. I don't know if you did your reading, but if you caught this, I found this to be absolutely fascinating. He said, there are many causes for the collapse of the empire in the West. Remember, it's only in the West that it collapsed. It did not collapse in the East in Constantinople. It's just in the West. Uh, in the late 5th century, but the historical evidence does not support the popular myth that somehow these hordes of greedy sort of Germanic tribes came in uh, that were savage and invaded the territory and just basically conquered it through a bloody spasm, right? So that's, that, that was always my, the way I was kind of taught was like, you know, these, these non sort of ethnic Romans came in and just said, you know, through war and bloodshed and they just took over. He said, that's, that's, the evidence doesn't really support that. Uh, what actually happening is because it became enfeebled and it became exhausted and collapsed in on itself. Here's what he says. After 500 years of rule, the Roman Empire started to buckle from exhaustion. Romans simply lost confidence in their society. It was the exhaustion and lack of confidence, not the church or invading hordes of barbarians that broke the Roman system. Civilization requires confidence in the society in which one lives. Belief in its philosophy, belief in its laws, and confidence in one's own mental powers. In other words, the whole reason why the society exists, the foundational principles, vigor, energy, vitality, all the great civilizations or civilizing uh, epochs have a great, have a weight of energy behind them. So if one asks why the civilization of Greece or Rome collapsed, the real answer is that it died from exhaustion. It should be a warning to any country or any civilization, right? If you forget who you are and your foundational principles and the sort of vigor that comes with that and an energy, your civilization will collapse and die. Learn from history. Then we have the conversion of the Franks. I think uh, St. Uh, Clotilda 
is probably one of the most underestimated uh, people in the history of civilization. She, um, I didn't even know about her, right? That tells you something. She's not on our calendar. She's on the, uh, the French calendar, but um, she is one of the most important saints in all of church history. Clotilda was a Catholic, a very strong Catholic. She sounded like quite a woman to me. When you write about it, you're like, wow. Like, I want to get to know her and have a cup of coffee uh, with her, right? And say thank you. And even maybe a dinner or something, right, with her. Is somebody saying something? <laughs> at, <laughs> at my place? I don't think so. No, maybe at the church or something. We'll have dinner here, yeah. I guess I have like a peanut gallery out there. It's just, this, this is great. Uh, she's very strong in the Catholic faith. She marries Clovis. In the 5th century, she prays constantly for his conversion. Who does she sound like? I'm telling you, man, behind every phenomenal guy, you have a more phenomenal woman who's more greatly rewarded in heaven than the guy is, right? Some of these women are all just rock stars. God bless my mother, yeah. Clovis did not pay much attention to Clotilda's reasoning, right, as guys often do, right? Her nagging. All right, you're Christian God. Okay, all right. When's dinner going to be ready? Just enough of your Christian God thing. She continued to argue with reason, and most importantly, she prayed for her husband regularly. Then there's this beautiful scene where she loses her son shortly after he's baptized, right? And you can imagine Clovis making, you know, laying into her. Why would your God allow this? You know, the whole why does God allow evil type of thing. She remains confident She's called, that this child was called to heaven with his baptismal robes and would be nurtured in the sight of God. Did you read about that? He's now in heaven and he looks beautiful in his baptismal robes. I love that little excerpt from her. It's so darn good. Well, Clovis is engaged in this big battle. He's building his kingdom and he evokes Clotilda's God in the midst of it. It sounds like Constantine, right? It's something like this beautiful moment. And the battle swings in his favor. Clotilda must be ecstatic when he comes home and says, you're not going to believe what happened. She contacts the bishop, prepares Clovis for a baptism. Clovis is concerned, uh, naturally so, right? He's in charge of like thousands and thousands of pagan troops. And he's got to tell them that I'm going to be baptized into this poor man's religion. He starts to wonder, what are my troops going to say, right? And rightly so, right? And he tells them, and he's overjoyed by the fact that his troops say, we want to be baptized too. If you're that good of a leader, you have that outlook, we're going with you which makes sense, right? Whenever you form a treaty with somebody, the subjects go along with it. So he has this entire conversion. And really, as we're going to see, this conversion with Clovis in the Frankish kingdom really preserves Orthodox Christianity from Arianism and the Germanic. Because Arianism had infiltrated up in, into what's, you know, ancient Germany. You know, Germany didn't really be formed until, like, right, the 19th century. Uh, so they're all Arians up there, and they kept bringing the Arian faith and the non-Orthodox faith west. So it's the conversion of Clovis that really preserves, in some sense, Orthodox Christianity uh, and saves Europe eventually. Just a little bit about Clovis. Uh, he ruled from uh, Gaul, which is ancient France, uh, from 481 to 511. Uh, the re he really transforms the Roman Empire into what's now uh, essentially Europe. He is the founder of uh, the um, Maravingian, it's hard word to say, Maravingian dynasty, this 200-year dynasty of a line of uh, Frankish kings from the 5th century to 751. Catholic Christianity spreads throughout Western Europe to combat those Aryan tribes there. So uh, this little Frankish kingdom there, and we're going to talk a probably more about that next time uh, when we get there. So he has this conversion. He is baptized on Christmas Day in 496 because of the prayers of his wife, his beloved wife, Clotilda, uh, by the bishop there. Uh, and the uh, prayers of Genevieve of Paris were also answered. Clovis um, is baptized there in Run. Uh, and then 3,000 Frankish warriors are also baptized. with 3,000. Like, wow. Thank you, Clotilda. Like, you are a rock star. We, we like, love you. 
the holy oil used to anoint Clovis was used to anoint the kings of France for the next 1,300 years. It's pretty cool. It's a fun little fact. The saintly wife of Clovis outlived him for 34 years. She spent decades financing the construction of churches and monasteries and living a penitential life, a prayer, first in Paris and then in the shrine of St. Martin of Tours. Uh, she changed the course of church history. Clovis was the only Catholic king in the West, and his conversion legitimized the faith in the eyes of his people, who previously viewed it as the religion of the weak and conquered Galileo um, Gallo um, Romans. The Franks would dominate the continent for centuries, which contributed to the eventual conversion of the Aryan Germanic tribes. Why? Because of Clotilda and her many prayers. With the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, the church will have to fill this vacuum left by the void of the central governing authority. It will become the main administrator in holding the European fabric together. While society is fractured, the church will hold the fabric of that Western society. We can thank the church for what's now Europe, but unfortunately for the last, what, 100 years or so, it has been distancing itself from the church and it's now fracturing and it's losing its way. What did Christianity contribute? I'm drawing this from an article that I read in December uh, from Weigel talking about the contributions of Christianity over the years. He says that it brings, so far we've seen that Christianity brings a radical equality of all in Christ in an empire that with a highly stratified population. Remember, Rome was all about nobility, commoners, slaves. And if you're in a certain section, that's where you stay. Christianity really obliterated that, right? And said that we're all united in Christ, man and woman, slave and free. It also desacralized the state. Caesar is not God and therefore not omnipotent and his power is limited. He is not above God in his laws, but rather must be established laws and policies accordingly. This is forgotten in the 20th century when we have the rise of these fascist states, right? And communism that says the state is God. And the state is the all-powerful authority. And millions and millions of people will die because of these ide ideologies of the 20th century, the bloodiest century on record. That was forgot, that the state is not God. By desacralizing the state, limiting the state's power, Christianity opens the space for democracy where people elect their representatives. Also, Christianity to redefine what it means to be heroic and the capacity for heroic virtue. Typically, a hero was an aristocrat from a leading family, successful and materially. Christian martyrs became the heroes, heroes from every class, including the slave class. Heroism was not a function of class or sex. Anybody can be a hero, not just the wealthy and the rich. St. Augustine's City of God strengthened our understanding that it's possible to be oriented to a transcendent world and to be responsible to transcendent truths while engaged in this world. That's individually and an entire country as well can be oriented, oriented towards God. Also, the ancient world focused on physical perfection as modeled in athletes in glory as the perfect human being. Christian monks offered a new kind of grace in glory, the conquest of the will in an arena in which the individual heard the voice of God, not the cheers of crowds. Christianity another layer of, brought about another layer of human dignity our capacity for interiority, for the contemplative, the encounter with the ultimate truths, and ultimately inside the person. All of this Christianity brought, which is wonderful. Now, we've made it through our time here this morning. Your next homework assignment is going to be chapter 4, just the first half, pages 147 to 171. You are going to be reading about the quote-unquote Dark Ages, which was um, uh, termed by historians of late, which is actually not accurate. You're going to see saint, saints like St. Saint Patrick, St. Benedict, St. Greg the Great, and St. Boniface to the Germans. We're going to get in the sticky situation of the rise of Islam in the 7th century in the Battle of Poitiers uh, in 732, which saved Christianity uh, from being overrun and Europe being overrun by uh, Muslims. So those are going to be our next topics that we meet. So we're meeting in uh, a week, a quick turnaround, because I have my retreat the last week of January, so I had to move it up one week. So you have a bit of homework to do between now and a week from today on Tuesday. Okay? Questions, thoughts, concerns, wonders, emotions. Should we say a little prayer to close? In the name of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth in peace. Amen. Mm-hmm.